All right, what's going on, guys? So uh, super excited to be doing this show today. Uh, right now, we've got Dr. Sam Spinelli. I'm going to let him kind of intro himself. So Sam, why don't you take it away and uh, let us know a little bit about yourself, your background, and kind of what you're doing right now. Absolutely. So my name is Sam Spinelli. I am a doctor of physical therapy and a certified strength and conditioning coach. I've worked in the fitness and strength and conditioning industry for about uh, 14 years now and across that time I've been in high performance settings. I've worked with um, a lot of professional hockey players, Olympic sport athletes across a few different um, sports here in Canada. Then I've worked with a lot of different weightlifters, powerlifters, uh, some people winning IPF medals and then lots of people competing at the international stage for weightlifting and a uh, physical therapist now for the last two years and uh, recently moved back to Canada. So up here in the great white North and uh, just kind of like run my own thing up here, do what I want yeah. and uh, I have a couple of online businesses that essentially pay my bills. That's awesome, man. Yeah. So one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on today to, to uh, talk about kind of biceps tendinitis and shoulder impingement is uh, because I think you bring a really unique perspective to a lot of these conversations because not only do you have a lot of clinical experience, but you also have a lot of experience as an as a competitive athlete yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you haven't checked out Sam's Instagram, definitely check it out. Um, we were kind of chatting, you know, a while back because I think you did a 440 front squat for like a double or something like that, and I was like, <laughs> "Fuck me!" So um, he's a strong dude, and and so I think that brings a really interesting perspective. Uh, like I said, that kind of integrates both the clinical side and the actual practical side. So um, we'll just dive right into it. So. A lot of people hear these terms like biceps tendonitis, uh, shoulder impingement, and you know they kind of experience some of these pains, especially powerlifters during benching or squatting. Um, what exactly are these? Can you kind of give us a little bit of insight into to what they are? Yeah, so whenever we get into the like topic of pain, pain is a pretty complex thing. It's really tricky to hammer down and do a, a good job on it. But if we're looking at primarily like the pathological side of things. Mm -hmm. So biceps. Uh, tendon related pain I, I hesitate in calling it tendonitis in that you know like right now a lot of the world of research is indicating that we don't really have any inf inflammation which is the itis aspect of that mm -hmm. and um, so essentially like if someone has anterior shoulder pain so pain on the front side of their shoulder it's probably related to that bicep structure uh, that you have a long head of your bicep that runs across the front side for anyone uh, is this gonna be a video or is this gonna be both, both? yeah so for the uh, people just listening on audio, essentially like the, it, your bicep tendon runs along the front part underneath your delt. And in that region, it's common for some people to experience a lot of pain that might be associated with either doing, you know, uh, pulling your arm back behind your body. Um, if it's highly irritable, maybe going overhead, these different types of activities where essentially that region uh, has some compression on it. And contrast, we have that other one, which is shoulder impingement, which is really like a big junk term right now um, across the last decade we've seen a lot of research starting to emerge out saying that like we shouldn't even use the term that it doesn't necessarily mean what we thought uh, basically like completely destroying any information that we had on it previously I actually just did a podcast on the e3 rehab one that we haven't released yet with um, someone named Lori Michener who's one of the world's leading shoulder impingement researchers and she said that you know like right now they have modeling data indicating that if the shoulder does impinge, because um, for anyone that doesn't know, like the, the classical theory is that when you take your arm above, uh, out to your side and then above your head, your uh, arm bone will contact your chromion, part of your shoulder, and it pinches in on your supraspinatus when your muscle's there. And most of the classic theory is that it happens right around 90 degrees and then up above that. And her research has basically indicated that it doesn't happen there. If it does happen, it happens at around 30 to 70 degrees, and then it doesn't happen anymore. So it actually doesn't happen uh, where people experience pain. And um, so there's just like a lot of information that's kind of like drastically changing our current knowledge on uh, when someone does experience it. Because we see that a lot of people do experience pain in that rough region. We just don't necessarily know directly why. Mm -hmm. um, there's a moderate amount of evidence kind of like indicating that's probably that in that position we're really challenging our supraspinatus to work really hard and being able to move our shoulder upwards essentially like the range where most people have shoulder pain at around like you know 70 to 110 degrees over here 
at that position, our deltoid isn't really in a good position to be able to help assist in rotating the arm upwards. And so then our supraspinatus has to really kick in to do that. And if someone is deconditioned, if someone isn't very well trained in their supraspinatus, all these different factors, it just can't handle the job. And it's pissed off, it's irritated. And then you add in that possibly it was compressed previously. Yeah, so um, essentially the, the easiest way to identify them is like, if you have biceps tendon, if you have anterior shoulder pain, it's probably more biceps related. If you have something shoulder impinging, it's like pain on the side of your shoulder, it hurts more when you take your arm out to the side. So that's really interesting. One of the things that I kind of noticed from what you said right now, and then a lot of the stuff that I've kind of been hearing about pain science and kind of diagnostics in general is kind of a move and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, like a move away from some of these really specific diagnostics, like you said, you know, uh, tendonitis, um, and kind of wanting to move away from that a little bit and then specifics for like, okay, here's exactly why this tissue is damaged. Therefore a B and C is going to occur into a little bit more like almost bro terms. Like you were saying, just <laughs> anterior shoulder pain, you know, which is a pretty, pretty catch all term, but it, it kind of makes sense though. Um, because of how complicated some of these things are. And there's, there's a lot more nuance than I, I also think that sometimes maybe we attribute, uh, I guess, causality that isn't always there. Um, I don't know. What, what, what are your kind of thoughts on that? I guess. Yeah. On the one side, it's really funny because I, you know, I was listening to this expert in the pain world and he was like, mm -hmm. you know, I have patients come to me, you know, they have complaints of like pain on the front side of their knee and then they leave and they're told, yes, you have pain on the front side of your knee. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> he's yeah. like, I have, two, I, I have a doctor of physical therapy. I have two PhDs. And it, it did not take my education to be able to tell you that. Obviously, you have pain on the front side of your knee. He's yeah. like, but in reality, in reality, I could give you a bunch of different um, recommend. I could give you a bunch of different diagnoses from a, like a clinical standpoint of you have patellofemoral pain or you have patellar tendinopathy or any of these things. And it's like, realistically, the conversation about what you do with that like you have pain on the front side of your knee, it doesn't it doesn't significantly change between any of those. Same with like, so you have anterior shoulder pain, whether it's biceps tendinopathy, being reactive tendinopathy, being degenerative tendinopathy, reactive on degenerative, like, you know, tendinitis, tendinosis, all these different terms that we could throw, or you're having, you know, um, coracobrachialitis or any of these different things, like you have pain on the front side of your shoulder, how you, uh, how you actually implement um, practical solutions to reduce that pain, improve your function, all that kind of stuff. It doesn't really change by what your pathological diagnosis is. And what we have seen is that, that there's not necessarily any benefit, but there's possibly negative factors to start adding on these diagnoses to people. Like in the case of rotator cuff tears, we've seen that if you tell someone that they have a rotator cuff tear, you know, the having one doesn't necessarily mean a lot but you tell someone that they have one and it actually reduces the likelihood that they improve. It makes them usually more um, avoid utilizing their shoulder, which decreases their function in it, more likely increases their pain. We have the same thing with people that if you tell them that they have knee osteoarthritis, we have the same thing if you tell someone that they have a disc herniation. It's just like all these different things where it's like, you know, we can't necessarily directly attribute someone's pain to having these things, mm -hmm. but if you tell someone that they have them, it actually makes them worse. And so then, yeah. but then people, people want a diagnosis of some kind. So you got to figure out something to give someone. So it's, it's a very tricky situation. Um, like for me, currently in my practice, when someone comes in and they have uh, shoulder pain, I have a conversation about that it's possible if my findings indicate that they might have a rotator cuff tear, we'll have a discussion about what that means and whether or not it's going to have a long-term impact on them. And in my case, like I, I'm not doing randomized control trials to prove my information, but I don't see that my patients are necessarily having negative impl 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 implications. From it. <laughs> and so the difference though, is that if you ever spend time in a physician's office or a lot of even physical therapists or any of these different practitioners, they don't necessarily provide a lot of education about what that means. And that's arguably one of the reasons we're having a big issue with this. I spoke to Ben Darlow, who is one of the world's leading researchers on this conversation. He's, he basically just like spends his whole time 
doing medical research on the on the uh, impact of words, so essentially semantics. And his thing was that what we currently know is that if you tell someone that they have any of these kinds of things, it makes them worse. But if you educate them about it and that it doesn't necessarily mean anything negative or that it could actually be a good thing, like he was t explaining to some patients about how, you know, in the case of disc herniation, if you have a disc herniation, we have tons of information to show that it will improve within two years for sure. It's very rare that it goes longer than that and that your pain will, and you know, it goes through the whole education piece. And in those cases, when they actually monitor those people, they do significantly better. And it's just from providing them a few minutes extra of education about what the condition actually means. Mm -hmm. Because if you leave them without that, then they're likely going to catastrophize and go down a very dangerous path of having no idea what they're going, what's going to happen to them. Um, and most people, out of fear of something bad being wrong or something being wrong with them, they avoid utilizing these different areas. You can see that, like when someone is told that they have back pain, they start to move differently and they start to avoid loading their back. Or someone has knee pain and they're told not not to use it, they avoid it. And the same thing can happen with the shoulder. Yeah, that's that's definitely something. Like as someone who's I've experienced my fair share of. Uh of back injuries mostly and hip and shoulder and all that jazz. And I think most people have, especially once you start getting a little bit stronger and a little bit higher up there. Mm -hmm. um, and I definitely noticed that there def there's a really, really strong drive to get a specific diagnosis because the idea is once I have a diagnosis, I can, I can, you know, start to pursue some sort of specific treatment protocol when in reality, it's like the diagnosis, like you were saying, it, it doesn't necessarily change the the treatment protocol mm -hmm. but i think it's a really hard like that's a really difficult concept to understand like even for me um it took a while before i was really like oh okay yeah I, i'm kind of starting to understand you know the whole pain science thing a little bit better like enough to just kind of have basic conversations about it anyways and when i had my back injury that wasn't a conversation i had with the physio at all they told me that I had presented with discogenic symptoms, even though it was like on and off and they had me doing these ridiculous exercises. And I was like, this isn't helping. Like 10 months later, I was worse. And so I just left and started being like, you know what, I'm just going to do what feels good and I'm going to get strong and whatever. And that's not a recommendation, but it's more so just kind of reaffirming that, yeah, like those conversations definitely don't happen that much. Um, and they need to happen a whole lot more because I think people really struggle to kind of understand the, the nuance, but then mm -hmm. at the same time, the kind of simplicity that comes with it. And it doesn't need to be this like, oh, I have this tear, or I have this bulge, or I have this whatever. Um, so kind of moving past that, like, how do you differentiate between like, let's just say discomfort, that's something that, like you said, kind of will, might pass versus something that potentially could lead into, you know, a little bit more problematic or become a pathology potentially. Like how, how would you be able to differentiate that in the shoulder? Uh, yeah. So when it comes to pretty much any region, there's a few like key things to ever be concerned about. And it's like, first off, have you noticed that you have a significant decrease in strength or muscle mass? So um, in the case of the shoulder, if someone has, for instance, like something that could be more related to their neck, actually. So there's these different conditions um, because your nerves from your sh that um, allow you to use your shoulder come from your neck. If you have like a significant disc herniation or any of these other kind of conditions that might limit the ability for the nerves to pass down, you might notice that you either can't lift your arm up anymore or that you can't lift it to a certain degree. And it's not that it's painful inherently, but that you just legitimately cannot do that. And it's just come out of like essentially nowhere. It's not like, oh yeah, over the last three months, I've just noticed that I can't really do it as well. It's like yesterday I could pick my arm up overhead and now today I can't pick it up to 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. And then another similar thing with that is like, if you've noticed over the last couple of weeks that your shoulder mass has drastically decreased and you know, like sometimes we try to look at this in like the back or the hips or something, it can be a little bit tricky. But with the shoulder, you have very easily to be able to see the other other shoulder. Most people have a relatively similar mass in each shoulder. There is like, you know, a small difference. But if you look at your one shoulder and you see that like there's just a spot, like let's say where your uh, medial deltoid is, it's just like suddenly sunken in. Well, that's probably because the nerve has now like not been innervating it fully in that you've got something more serious to go and get looked at. That's like one of the top ones. 
Um, past that, if you have like distinct numbness and tingling in your shoulder, and um, it's something that's not going away. Like if you have numbness and tingling that happens for a second, a couple minutes, it's not necessarily a big deal. Um, it's really common for, for instance, like baseball players where they go to throw a really aggressive pitch and then their arm starts to go numb for a minute. That's called a brachial plexus traction injury where essentially like you just threw so hard that your nerves actually got tugged on and they can have numbness and tingling that goes on for like 20, 30 minutes and then it goes away and they'll just like naturally recover from it. So um, in the contrast, if someone has numbness and tingling that doesn't go away for days on end, that's where it's like, okay, you might want to be having this checked out. Once we get past that stuff, unless you have like, you know, pathological history of cancer or something more sinister, or you possibly are having a heart attack, which can come in like tons of different signs, particularly in the shoulder. Outside of that stuff, it's like most things are not necessarily dangerous. Um, and worst case, like in this, the scary side of things, you have like a rotator cuff tear or you have a... Yeah or you have bicep tendinopathy. Like they're not, they're not these things that are like urgent and need attention. And in most cases, once we get past those things, like um, the scary stuff, and we're looking at these other options, then it's about just like waiting to see what happens. Like, can you go a month and see how your symptoms change? Because a lot of people start to freak out as soon as they have any pain and want to go see someone. And it's understandable. Like I go through the same thing where, you know, I go and I have back pain one day and I'm like, oh fuck, what did I do now? And it's like, calm down, see what happens, wait a few days, wait a few weeks, see how it changes, monitor, which can be very frustrating, especially if you don't know. Um, but if you can wait that time out, in most cases, it's, I think it's 75 to 80% of um, like uh, musculoskeletal pain will clear up within four to 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. And so like most people having an issue will have it completely resolved, no issues, and in four to 12 weeks if they just chill out and wait. And for lifters and people that are probably listening to this podcast, that can be very frustrating because like you're probably gonna have your training affected. Like I know that I had that exact same thing happen where I don't really experience too many shoulder issues, but like I'll have knee or back pain that or hip pain that pops up and I have to modify my training for a few weeks and it really irritates me. And so like, I completely understand. But in most cases, as long as I can modify my training and continue going, it will self-resolve and I don't have to do anything significant about it. Yeah. Um, and this is the same case with the shoulder. Like if you're experiencing, you know, some sort of anterior lateral shoulder pain, it will likely clear up in four to 12 weeks. And there's some things that you can do to possibly re reduce its likelihood of returning, but you don't necessarily have to go see a physician. You don't necessarily have to go see a physio. Like most cases you can self-manage these things. I really like what you said about the whole catastrophizing uh, thing because that happens. And I mean, even, you know, you mentioned yourself, like you are a doctor of physical therapy and even though you know these things, you know, it's very different when you've got skin in the game and when it's your arm that's feeling the pain. And so I've definitely noticed that, um, cause I've experienced bicep tendinitis, uh, quite, quite often, like on and off, like for, for a while there. And it got pretty painful at, at times where like, I literally couldn't even bench like I don't know, 60%. And I was just like, man, this is brutal. It was that painful. And my biggest fear was, I was like, man, like, am I going to blow my pec off? Am I going to blow my bicep? Like what's going to happen? It was just so painful in here. And, uh, and I think like for me anyways, just kind of hearing that from you, it, it gives me a lot of reassurance where it's like, okay, you know what, this is painful. Um, so long as I'm not being an idiot, I don't necessarily have to worry about some of those things. Um, which kind of leads me, I guess, into, into the next question of, you mentioned, you know, things like rotator cuff tears and how the rotator functions with, within the context of, you know, the shoulders and, and uh, impingements and things like that. So I, I found a handful of studies that was talking about uh, biceps tendonitis and their, their prevalence of, I guess, occurrence within the context of, of having an existing rotator cuff issue or, or, sort of discrepancy within the rotator cuff. Can you kind of speak to that? Yeah, so for anyone that doesn't know, um, your rotator cuff is made up of four primary muscles. You have one on the top, two on the back side, one on the front. And their function is to obviously rotate the shoulder. They also work to suction the shoulder. They also then have a bunch of secondary functions, 
like helping to lift your arm up, pulling it back, moving it forward. Essentially, any motion that you could do with your shoulder, your rotator cuff is involved. And one of the most common muscles to become um, injured in it is the supraspinous, the muscle on the top. And there's a lot of different reasons why that might be the case. One is the possible impingement theory and these other things that can go on with it. But um, when any muscle gets injured, it inherently can't function as well as it previously did. Like right now, if I stab your quad, it's not gonna be able to do the, the same job that it was doing before. It's just not a thing. And so if you still have to do the same task, you have to figure out a way to get that job done still. And in order to get that job done, other muscles are then therefore gonna have to step up and do a greater work. And in the case of the shoulder, the long head of the biceps tendon, it, um, it runs in a way that it can help assist in some of these actions that the supraspinatus does. And so what the theory is that essentially when we have the rotator cuff injured, particularly the supraspinatus, and it's not able to fully function to the best degree, the long head of the bicep or the, the, the biceps in general is increasing its function in the shoulder related tasks. And the long head is in an area where it is highly likely to be compressed and challenged. And because of that, it then can become irritated. And as it's becoming more and more involved, it might not be as sufficiently prepared to do these tasks. It's also not in a mechanically advantageous position to do them. And the combination just makes it that the, uh, the tendon gets irritable, essentially what is generally called tendonitis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, uh, I, so I actually dislocated my shoulder um, mm -hmm. way, way back. And I've noticed that it does kind of feel loose. And this is always the side that I get issues on. And I've been told that, yeah, because I have some, some issues with my rotator that uh, it could potentially be affecting the, some of the anterior shoulder pain. Um, yeah, then that's, that, yeah, exactly. Like that's in, in that same point, like one of the things that's been shown is that for a lot of people with um, chronic, number one, um, like looseness description of their shoulder, yeah. improving the general function of the rotator cuff is often beneficial and helpful because it essentially does that suction job. And then for people that have a history of having anterior shoulder pain, improving the strength of the rotator cuff, particularly like the external rotation aspect of it, usually reduces how much the long head of the bicep tendon has to be involved. And so then therefore, it's just kind of like, you know, if you're, if your quad's irritated because you make it do all the work and then you have your glutes kick in to help, it's not that, you know, your glutes weren't doing a sufficient job. It's just that, your quad couldn't handle it and you shifted the load onto the glutes. Mm -hmm. So it's the same sort of thing with the shoulder. It's just that, you know, the story that you tell about it. Yeah. So you said something kind of interesting there actually about uh, like the looseness of, of the shoulder. Um, and I've heard those terms just kind of used colloquially, uh, like either looseness or tightness of the shoulder being um, somewhat causative of some of these issues. Like, can you, kind of explain the difference between the two and I guess how they might impact um, pain or, or uh, some of the, yeah. not necessarily pain, but some of the, how you'd go about kind of treating that, I guess. Sure. So um, first thing is that a lot of this stuff is a combination of reality and perception. When we're looking at um, the, 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 what we feel, it's not necessarily a reflection of reality, at least um, what's actually going at on at a tissue level. A prime example is when someone says like, this feels tight or this is stiff. You know, if I were to lay you down and you say, yeah, my shoulder feels stiff and I go through and I measure everything and you have still full range of motion, well then technically by that you're not necessarily tight, but it feels stiff to you. Like it, it feels harder to move essentially. Like you feel resistance when you're going in a direction. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that can occur for a wide range of reasons. And it's really tricky to exactly pinpoint it. Um, usually the most likely thing is that you just have some sort of protective guarding from your nervous system. For some reason, you don't want to go into an area. For some reason, you are limiting your ease into a position. And so that's where, you know, like you asked about like what I do practically. And I'm not really a huge stretcher. I don't really think that there's tons of value in it at least um, when we're looking at like the hierarchical standpoint of like where to go first, I would sooner start with something like a resistance into a position. 
So essentially like either concentric or eccentric loading directed towards getting into the position someone struggles with. Usually with an emphasis towards eccentric loading just because it helps to get you into the position, it helps to contract lengthening, essentially the goal that someone has, and there's usually less resistance or guarding into it. So, you know, like if we're talking about someone that has, um, they feel like their shoulder's stiff and they struggle in going overhead, we might do some, um, for instance, external rotation in an eccentric format where someone lays on their back, they have a weight in their hand with their shoulder out to the side and they rotate backwards, eccentrically loading into external rotation, coming back up and then repeating that or doing a shoulder flexion version where they're taking their arm straight overhead because your body generally is more comfortable going slow, control eccentrically into the position than coming out of it. And then we can progress into like the concentric, which is like the more quote unquote functional. Right. Uh, yeah. No, so that's that what I'll often do sense. with those things. Yeah. Um, so how would you approach, I guess, let's say someone does have, have uh, an issue. Um, I've definitely seen uh, a lot of, I guess, prescriptions for monitoring velocity. So let's say, you know, powerlifters don't generally do tons and tons of speed training, but they might be doing like, let's say light training and they end up moving relatively ballistically because they're so strong. And so how, I guess, would you incorporate, um, reintroducing some of that velocity back into their training, uh, over time, if that's something that potentially is, um, I guess, contraindicated at the time or like initially in, in the rehabilitation process. Yeah, for some people, um, like if we have someone that has tendon, tendon related pain, you know, tendons are a um, tissue that is often more irritable with higher rates of contraction. So if someone has biceps tendinopathy and they're doing a very fast bench press where it gets lengthened and then contracted very quickly, it could be more irritated just with the speed than actually the position or the load that we utilize. Um, so utilizing a velocity prescription is really handy and it's something that I utilize when I'm coaching athletes. The tricky thing is that if someone is actually measuring velocity, you can't just like give them a straight up number of like, you have to stick to this. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's a matter of like, you're currently irritable at X, X speed. And we don't know what X speed is until you go to that speed and then say, yeah, that hurt. <laughs> and so yeah. having the conversation with someone of like, Okay, I want you. What what I'll do is, if I have someone that has a way to actually measure their bar speed, I'll have them go in and start working up. And it's like, okay, this is the load that the aim is for today. I want you to go and start off with your first few sets at a more like comfortable, not aggressive speed, and decide if that feels comfortable. If it does, okay, now I want you to start to gradually pick up the speed, and we're going to look at the numbers, and we're going to monitor at what point do you say, okay, I think this is starting to get questionable, and then I want you to keep going until you say okay, no, that, that was not good. And we're going to keep track of all of these things. And then after you're done, we're then going to start to prescribe following that. And fortunately, like I can explain that to my athletes and they understand that I'm purposely trying to piss off their tissue so that I can know what I'm then going to prescribe. And usually they buy in, they're cool with that. If I have someone that's not comfortable with that, which is uh, fortunately for me, not that often, then I'll just go with saying like, I just want you to start at a slow speed, something moderate like you're not putting a lot of effort into it and then every session we just try to add more speed to it mm -hmm. um so it's not a very uh, straightforward answer unfortunately it makes sense though and i think i think the the people who are going to be listening to this can have enough experience to kind of be able to do that intuitively um because yeah no that makes a lot of sense so kind of regarding like specific prescriptions for being able to train through some of these issues like a lot of the times if i have someone who's saying, hey, you know, I'm getting some, some of that anterior shoulder pain. Um, I might just either augment the, the loading. So maybe utilize bands or a board press, probably board press over bands. Because um, a lot of the times, like the compression happens at the bottom of the lift. That's usually where people mm -hmm. experience the most, uh, the most pain or discomfort. And in a squat, you know, if their hands are real tight, especially with low bar, I might switch them to high bar, safety bar squat, or like open up their hands. Um, how do you go about, I guess, uh, do you, do you have anything that you prescribe that you found to be like specifically effective for kind of being able to continue training without having to really, really offset the, the program? Um, 
yes, period. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Yeah. So the first thing is like always, my goal is to keep the goal, the goal as long as possible. So I love um, that. <laughs> yeah. The, I kind of think of it as like a hierarchical standpoint again, of where like, what is the primary focus at this current time? So if someone is, you know, if we're talking about like primarily powerlifters or people that are like, you know, caring about their bench press or, you know, low bar squats and that sort of thing, then the conversation is heavily about how close to a competition or an important test are you? If you are close to one, then we need to figure out a way to keep the specificity as close as possible so that you are practicing low bar squats, you are practicing competitive bench press. In contrast, if we are further away and the primary emphasis at this current time block is just to like primarily get a big stimulus to encourage hypertrophic uh, adaptations, well, then I really don't care as much about sticking with low bar squats or specifically, you know, competitive bench press positioning. And so my prescription will usually differ between where we are in that timeline. Like if we are further away and someone is, you know, I'm, I have them prescribed to do low bar squats for, let's say, six sets of six. To, and um, they're saying that, like, it's causing some anterior shoulder pain. Okay, well, I'm totally fine with deviating going to a high bar squat. I'm sooner to make a modification exercise selection when we're further away because I don't think that the inherent exercise is that relevant. It's about like finding a means to stimulate growth in the quads, growth in the glutes, whatever about that. In contrast, if we're getting closer to competition, then I'm more likely to find a way to change the, the loading and stick with the exact pattern as much as possible. Like if I have to go, if, if we're doing bench press and we're close to a competition, I'm probably going to want to stick with their competitive grip position, stick with as many details as possible and try and find a way to figure out a means to get a heavy single in, and then I'll change other stuff if I need to. But we have to figure out a way to get a heavy single in that they can practice the pattern to the highest degree possible. And if the person says like, no, I'm, it's going to be irritable, but I'm comfortable doing a heavy single. And then the rest of my back off work changing, that's, that's fine. I'll do that. Same with like a low bar squat. Like if someone can do a heavy single and they're fine with that. And then from there, we have to then go into high bar squats for the sufficient back off work. That's an option that I've had to do. I had a, an athlete here in Canada who was um, the CPU champion for the 63 kilo class women. And she had the exact problem where like her shoulder would get super irritable with high bar or uh, low bar squats. And she is a phenomenal low bar squatter, but she could handle one single two or three days a week. And then anything afterwards, uh, when we got close to competition, because she frequently bench pressed as well, and she had one of the best benches in the competition. So she didn't want to sacrifice any of her volume for that. Mm -hmm. And so we then gave up low bar squatting as for volume and just went to high bar squatting. She was able to crush that no issue. And so then it was a, a means to an end to still get a good stimulus that still helped her proficiently improve strength, still practiced a very similar pattern and got a similar stimulus that she needed to. So I wouldn't say there's necessarily a distinct go-to, um, but we have to consider like where the athlete is in the timeline to decide like what's the most appropriate decision for them. And like, again, what is the most important stimulus that we can give at that timeline? Awesome. No, that's, a, that's a really great answer. Um, so, um, one thing that I know I hear a lot about, you've probably seen these, these ads on Facebook for little shoulder straps that make you kind of stand up straight and they fix your posture instantly. Um, I think a lot of people have concerns about posture. They have a lot of concerns about like shoulders rounding forward or being kyphotic or, or you know, what have you. And so how does, how does passive posture play into, I guess, structural integrity and then even like function when we're, when we're like looking at it from a dynamic sense? Right. So how are those things two related? Are they related at all? Yeah. Um, so for anyone that's not watching the video and you probably can't actually tell very well in the video, but I'm extremely slouched right now. Um, <laughs> I, 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 one of the most enjoyable things is that when I sit and have a conversation with patients, I purposely sit in less than I, less than ideal postures yeah. just because I instantly make sure to make a point that I don't think that this is a highly important thing. And I want it to be, 
um, something that the patient feels more comfortable. Cause like if I'm sitting in like this nice upright, perfect direct posture and I say, no, it's okay. Like, don't worry about it. It's kind of a redundant point to them. Mm-hmm. So essentially most of our current research from a, um, longitudinal standpoint doesn't really support that static passive posture really has a distinct impact on either a function b pain or structural changes and that can be a hard thing for a lot of people to think uh, or believe but if we just start to utilize some different analogies it often helps to make the point like right now most of the people listening are powerless probably and if you're a powerlifter, you've likely placed a bar on your traps hundreds and hundreds of times that has a substantial amount of weight and your traps have not eroded. And it's the same sort of concept with you know, most positions that we go to. When you sit on a chair, you're sitting on your hamstrings, you're sitting on your glutes and they don't go away. And you can sit on a chair for hours and it doesn't degrade the structures. And the same thing is kind of like in your shoulder where when I'm in a more kyphotic position, I possibly have more contact on some of the anterior shoulder structures, possibly some of the superior structures that we talked about, but that doesn't necessarily mean much. Just like the uh, bar swing on my traps doesn't destroy it. It's a type of stress that doesn't necessarily um, challenge our muscles to go away. Like your mu- if you um, just push in on a stake, it doesn't break down. That's not like the way that muscle tissues are made. They're not these fragile, weak things. They can handle um, pressure and compression relatively quite well. In contrast, if you were to like go and yank on them, like if I take my arm and I put it really far behind my back and I were to stay in this position for a very long time, that's creating a tensile load that possibly could be more irritable because that's what the um, muscles and tendons speak the language of tension not necessarily compression. And so a muscle is possibly going to become more irritated to be chronically stretched than it is to be chronically compressed. It just really depends upon, you know, which kind of thing we're talking about. Cause like your um, muscle belly or most of the structures that people will commonly have concern about are not ones that are going to have a lot of compression on them anyways. And so then like having compression on them isn't going to make a big deal. In contrast, if you have something like, you know, the um, long head of the biceps tendon, excessively compressing it, excessively putting a lot of tensile load on it might not be great, but that's a very not like, it's not an easy thing to do. Like in the case of the um, long head of the biceps tendon, the position that I was just showing, that's the position that it has tensile load on it. And it's also the position that has compression on it. And so like people don't usually hang out where they're having their arm behind their back for significantly long periods of time. So Mm -hmm. um, it's just like, we have a lot of postural beliefs in society and a lot of them are very inaccurate and they're often based off a lot of very weird things. Like if you start to pull into history of where posture came from, um, I actually got asked to speak at the world posture summit in 2018. And uh, I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah, yes, it is. I don't, I, I'm not sure if they really knew my standpoint on posture when they asked me to speak because everyone else gave presentations on how to like improve your posture. And I gave a presentation on why it was um, something to stop worrying about. It's like you're and, uh, your money go home. <laughs> presentation. Like, yeah. <laughs> Boom. And through that, I kind of like gave a highlight of like where we came with a lot of these theories. And most of them come from like, um, historical standpoints of trying to look more proper, like trying to be more presentable, not based off anything beyond that. But then they started to converse as people started to make correlations and think that there were causations. And it's just like, we've now learned that they're wrong, but it's going to probably take another 100 to 200 years to challenge all these beliefs. Yeah, it's like this deeply rooted culturally game, cultural game of like telephone. Yeah, that's funny. That's, that's crazy. <laughs> I, I guess I wouldn't have re- really even thought about that, um, like where it came from. So when, when someone does have some pain, and you mentioned earlier when someone kind of has apprehension signaling when, when they go into certain movements or they kind of try and like bypass certain positions, like if they're bending over, they might kind of twist and rotate first or something along those lines. How would you approach someone who does have like apprehension around going into specific movement or 
performing specific movements or getting into positions versus someone who, you know, just is okay with kind of pushing through the pain a little bit more? So it's a uh, excellent question and a little tricky because um, when we look at the person that is comfortable going through the pain, usually that is a completely fine thing within reason. You know, like most, most tissues aren't that easy to hurt. And so like if someone is having pain and it's because possibly that the tissue is actually injured, which is not always the case, but if it actually was and they just push through and they're able to like be that person that can grind their teeth and just like take a ton of abuse from themselves, it's possible that they could hurt themselves further, but it's relatively unlikely. So in most of those cases, I just like let people kind of do their thing. Like if, if you're comfortable pushing through and you don't find that the pain is highly increasing across you doing that, it's good to go in my, in my books. Like uh, most of the research that we have on anything related to this actually shows that like exercising through pain act, um, increases your results in rehab. We don't really have much um, showing the opposite we have research on shoulder related pain, hamstring related pain, uh, ACL, and a few other conditions. And they all consistently show that if you have someone exercise through pain, they actually get better results. They don't necessarily um, get better faster, but the results that they get in that same timeline will usually be better. Mm -hmm. Like the, there was a recent paper on where they had um, high level soccer players where they suffered a hamstring strain and they had them either in one group exercise through pain in the other group, if they had pain, they decreased the effort and they made the movements easier so that the person wouldn't have pain. And they both returned back to play in the same timeline. Um, like both groups averaged, I think like 17 days to return to play. But the group that exercised through pain was less likely to get re-injured. And the, they also had higher levels of strength. They also had higher levels of endurance, like essentially everything you'd ask for. Mm -hmm. um, Unfortunately, we do have some research showing that like some people believe that if I have pain while I do an activity, then I am damaging myself. And so if someone has like that very ingrained belief, then that person is likely going to have more issues come from it than the benefits that might occur. And for some people, it's going to be that we might have to modify their positioning, allow them to move around. Like you said, like you're bending forward and you find that as you bend straight forward, it hurts. You're not comfortable with that and you don't want to push through and you want to just deviate around. That's fine. Particularly if that's fine at a low load where we start to get into some of the changing conversation is about how much we deviate and at what level we're deviating. If we're looking at like a power lifter who most people um, train in a stance that is very consistent. So you, tr you relatively squat with a similar um, foot position, relatively similar toe out, relatively similar width, relatively similar pattern of descending down to the bottom position, all of these details. The same with like your deadlift position, same with your bench press position, they don't drastically change. Where, and so then your tissues are, have a certain level of capacity at those positions, at those ranges, at those movements. And so as we start to change that, they no longer had that same level of capacity. And so if we say that you're a um, person who deadlifts with a uh, standard position in your feet and everything, and we say like, okay, well, you're having back pain. Well, we're going to keep your load the same. We're going to keep everything the same, but I want you to stand a little bit more narrow. Well, it's actually possible that making that change and no other changes could overload some of the different structures and put you at more risk of an injury to what likelihood that is, is really tricky to say. And it really probably depends more on the level of effort that you were to reach, but it, it's a possible concern to take into consideration. And so for me, that's where, when I'm working with athletes who are like, no, I'm having like a substantial amount of pain and I feel like I need to deviate and like change something up. Oftentimes, like my prescription comes in the combination of, okay, well, you know, like if this person has anterior shoulder pain while we're benching and we've decided that we're gonna change it, I'm oftentimes going to make the modification, like if we're going to change grip width, like you mentioned earlier, which is a good option in a lot of cases, we'll change the grip width, but we're also going to reduce the RPE for at least one to two weeks so that you can accommodate and ensure that like, if you've never trained in a more narrow grip position, I want to make sure that we're not going to overload you and push you to a point where then we irritate something different. Like we don't need to add on a new injury. Mm -hmm. And so then it's just like, if you were to start most programs, 
um, like the first week of an of a training program, you're not going to RPE 10. Like that's not, you shouldn't be at least. Yeah. But there are people that will do that, especially if you try to stick with the same load, but you change to a position that you're not necessarily as strong with. Like if you normally bench 275 for four sets of six, and it's in your standard grip position, but you go to a more um, wide grip position to reduce the irritation on shoulder extension. Well, if you're not stronger in that position, well, that, that load relatively becomes way higher of a percentage. And so then instead of being an RPE seven, it might become an RPE nine or 10. Mm. And so um, sometimes we have to just, you know, reduce the general load as well. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Even a lot of the times if I'm just even introducing a new exercise to some of my athletes, um, even if they don't necessarily have pain, I'll usually start it off relatively low because it is a new addition to the program. I don't necessarily know how it's going to, you know, add on to the cumulative fatigue. We don't know how mm -hmm. that's going to impact, you know, subsequent sessions, all this sort of stuff. So that makes a lot of sense. And kind of coming back to your point about uh, some of the research that indicates that pushing through pain in a lot of cases, depending on your, you know, I guess, initial perspective, um, for me and for, I think for a lot of lifters, because generally speaking, at least my, my experience sort of suggests that lifters have probably more of an inclination to push through pain and go a little too hard than go a little too light, um, at mm -hmm. least the more serious ones. Uh, and so I think that makes a lot of sense as far as, you know, speeding up uh, some of, well, not speeding up, but getting a little bit better outcomes. Because like physiologically, yeah, it makes sense that you get better adaptations because you're being able to actually have, you know, greater stimulus. But then even psychologically, I think that that's pretty empowering that you're like, hey, you know what, this hurts, but it's not bad and it's not really getting worse and I'm getting stronger, I'm seeing improvements. So, hey, maybe this isn't the end of the world. Um, that definitely happened to me when I had back pain uh, okay. was, you know, I was going in and I was deadlifting and I was like, man, this hurts. But then I was like, but it doesn't hurt more. And it's not getting worse. And so the weight kept cr creeping up, you know, and I, I went from an empty bar all the way up and, and now it's like, Oh, okay. Yeah, this is, it was fine until like, it just didn't hurt anymore. And I was, I was fine. Mm -hmm. um, so it makes a lot of sense that that's the case. So actually one last question or a couple last questions. I want to be kind of respectful of your time. We're coming up on that hour mark in a little bit here. Um, one of the things that I wanted to just ask about was the role of like instability that um, comes into things like bicep tendonopathy or tendonitis and or like anterior shoulder pain, impingement, things like that. So, uh, you know, obviously doing something like a push up allows for a much more natural um, kind of movement of the, of the scapula. And, you know, even having a, a fixed position with the barbell um, creates a little bit more stability versus something like maybe bands or like a BOSU ball push up. I don't know why you'd be doing something like that, but even something like dumbbells, right, that offers another another level of instability. Um, is is that going to be beneficial for helping this? Is it going to be potentially, uh, you know, negative? Or, or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's interesting. So, you know, previously, I would have primarily said that um, utilizing any of these like thing that encourage instability would probably be primarily negative for most of these um, conditions. A big aspect of that is in the case of like biceps tenopathy, we outlined you know, earlier that um, when the, one of the reasons that it possibly is occurring is that it's a secondary issue related to uh, decrease in ability for your rotator cuff to do its sufficient job and the bicep tendon kicks in to help provide more stability to the region essentially. And so then if we go to an exercise where we inherently increase the instability, well, that obviously is gonna make it more challenging to do the job. Like you're doing barbell bench press and your rotator cuff is at its max already and um, your biceps tendon is kicked in, you know, I don't know, 50% greater than it would otherwise. And then we go to dumbbell bench press and now your rotator cuff is already maxed out. We've increased the instability. So now your bicep tendon obviously has to increase even further. Well, that doesn't seem like a very good choice. So in most cases, like utilizing something that has like a significantly increased degree of instability probably isn't beneficial. Like it likely doesn't uh, increase the um, benefit for the biceps tendon or any of these other structures. However, one argument you could flip this around on 
And uh, there's a Canadian researcher out in Newfoundland. His name is Bem. And uh, he's got a bunch of different research showing that essentially like we decrease the level of ability to utilize um, different muscles when we have greater degrees of instability. So you can't produce as much force. And that you could argue is a benefit in that um, if you're not able to uh, produce as much force with your pecs, not as able to produce as much force with your triceps, et cetera, you can't use as much load. So then thereby, not by, by not being able to use as much load, you would decrease how much um, demand is then utilized for your rotator cuff, for your biceps, because they have a relatively lower um, force to be able to control. So there's a lot of arguments that you could go about it. I think that like generally it's not that beneficial. I'm just like, you know, prefacing as much information as I can. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would say that like, I don't see there being benefit to it. You're probably better off like utilizing as stable of a surface as possible doing a classic push-up, doing a classic um, uh, classic bench press more often than not. In the case of a push-up, interestingly, I think that it's like highly underrated for a lot of shoulder conditions, particularly bicep tendinopathy as an example, because having the shoulders given the freedom to be able to move in contrast to bench press, and in my opinion, you should pin them down. Um, there's a lot of benefit in giving more freedom for your shoulder to figure out a position that deloads uh, whatever is currently irritable. Like a lot of times, if you give someone more degrees of freedom, they'll figure out a solution that inherently allows the best outcome. Mm -hmm. And so if you let someone have more degrees of freedom in the case of a push-up versus a bench press, they'll likely figure out some way of getting the task done to still do a lot of push-ups, get a lot of push-up volume in and possibly not irritate it. Um, plus, when we uh, do push-ups versus with bench press, we also have a lot of secondary activation on some of these other muscles like your serratus anterior, your infraspinatus to a higher degree that also is likely going to encourage greater benefit to reduce um, load on the biceps tendon, which would be beneficial for some people that have um, that pain in that anterior shoulder position, but still be able to accumulate a lot of volume. So like when I'm working with a power lifter who's having that, and we're farther away from competition, I utilize a ton more push-ups personally. Mm. That makes a lot of sense. And actually, like, due to the whole COVID shutdown thing, there was about two months there where I wasn't able to lift weights. And so I was forced to do dips and push-ups and pull-ups and all these different things that I just was like, oh, this is lame. And uh, I, I was shocked at how much I, like, I knew push-ups and stuff like that was, like, effective, but I really think I underestimated their value as, mm -hmm. as an exercise and, like, just calisthenics in general and how much you can actually benefit from them. So I, I couldn't agree more, honestly, because I felt like doing push-ups at different angles and different tempos and things like that, as well as the dips, like you were saying, freed up my shoulders for a lot more movement. And so it actually improved um, shoulder health and just kind of how things felt, mobility, like, I felt less restricted. So that, that's actually a really good point. Um, I often hear people saying like, you know, oh, if, if, you know, you're experiencing some pain or this or that, like, it's just because, you know, whatever is experiencing pain is a little too weak, you know? And it's like, it's weird because I think there's some sort of truth to it. You know what I mean? But I think it's, it's really vague at best. And I don't think it's a great, recommendation you know because at the same time i see you know powerlifters who are extremely strong presenting with same you know same uh, same issues and i'm like okay this guy's pressing 500 pounds over his head like how much stronger does he need to be before he you know doesn't experience any pain and and so i i do think there's a little bit of truth to it but at the same time i think it's kind of misunderstood um am i completely off base like can you give your thoughts to that yeah, I think it's a really common narrative and there, there's definitely some truth to it, but there's also a lot of inaccuracy for sure. Like you just outlined, mm -hmm. you know, like the case of powerlifters or any really strong person, like they still have pain. You know, I'm, I'm primarily a weightlifter right now and I hang out with lots of weightlifters and there's a guy in my gym who squats oh. over six, <laughs> just like the atmosphere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, it's just like there's this there's a guy at my gym who squats like mid 600s and uh, high bar style, very fast and explosive. 
and he has very thick quads and he has anterior knee pain. Is it because his quads are too weak? I really doubt that. And, you know, the, the prescription that I would probably give him is to strengthen his quads, but not necessarily because they're weak. And that's where I think some of the argument goes in is that a lot of the times the prescriptions that we give are to strengthen something but not because it's weak. A lot of the times in the research world, we see a lot of benefit come from doing resistance training or some sort of exercise therapy. And they often don't actually measure if strength change. They might change. They might measure if EMG change, they might measure other factors, but they often don't actually look to see if someone's distinct strength changed. And they'll still notice that they have a, a lot of benefit. And in some studies, we even see when they do measure strength, that there might not be much of a strength change, but their pain decreased or these other factors. And like, how do we reconcile that? Someone goes through a eight week strengthening program. They don't get stronger, which seems insane, but nonetheless, but their pain decreased. And it's like, okay, well, through the act of doing strengthening, we get tons of benefits beyond just strengthening the muscle. You know, the, you could make arguments about strengthening tendons, ligaments, all that kind of stuff. But you also improve self-efficacy. You improve your internal locus of control. All these like psychosocial factors that change as well. Now, in some people, it's hard to directly say that it's just those things. You also have other factors like for some people, resistance training can be an outlet. It can help calm you down. It can help give you... Um, it can reduce depression. It can help with sleep quality, all, all these other things as well. So it's like really, really complicated. Um, but on the other side of the spectrum, we do know that in the case of, you know, a lot of tendon related pain, we see that the best effects are made with utilizing heavy resistance training where we do see changes in strength. And so I don't think that there's necessarily like a straight answer of like, I don't think people are having pain because they're weak, but getting stronger often will alleviate a lot of people's issues. And it's probably in the case of many people that there's something that will benefit from consistent, regular strength training. We do see that across the board in research that people who participate in resistance training on a more regular basis do experience less injuries and less pain. Um, the exact reason for that is very complicated, but it's an easy argument to make that like essentially doing strength training is going to help you in a lot of ways. And one aspect is yeah. that it's going to reduce your likelihood of pain and injury. And um, it's not necessarily that you're weak, but if you are experiencing an injury because you try to do a task and you weren't strong enough to do it, which is a case for a lot of people then strength training is an obvious way to solution that. Mm -hmm. um, but then we have the same thing of like you pointed out, you know, a funny example is Kabuki who he has tons and tons of injuries, tons of stuff going on. And he's also an absolute savage. Like <laughs> Duffin, Duffin, Duffin is a monster, Yeah. but yeah, Chris is he has, good. yeah, but he has so many injuries. And so like, I'm not going to say that he's weak. I'm not going to like try and like identify that anything is not sufficiently strong on him, but he has so many injuries. And so like, how do I create that as an answer? Like we don't have that information at the time. Mm -hmm. No, that makes sense. Um, so like I said, I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, thanks so much for, for jumping on here, answering all these questions. I learned a ton. Um, I'm sure everyone listening has, is, is going to learn a ton as well. Um, before we end off here, where can, uh, where can the listeners find you? Yeah, your best options are, you can follow me on Instagram. I've got an account, Dr. Uh, Dr. Sam Spinelli. Then I've got accounts, uh, E3 Rehab and Cis Athletics. Cis Athletics is more of like my general fitness channel that I share information on. And then, uh, E3 Rehab is my nerdy research rehab company. So, yeah. Awesome. Uh, is, is there anything, any big projects you're working on or anything you're looking to promote? Uh, no, nah, man, I'm just like constantly putting out as much information as I can. So never, n never anything that I can uh, directly push too hard. Awesome, man. Well, yeah, like I, I've definitely loved your content. It's, it's been great. I think this is our first actual like face to face chat. So it's, it's cool to actually connect. Um, yeah, super awesome conversation. So thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me guys. Thanks so much for listening. 
I hope you enjoyed the episode and took a lot from it that you can apply to your own situation to see much better results. I just have one quick personal favor to ask of you. Please make sure you subscribe and leave me a five-star rating on whatever podcast platform you're using. When you do this, it helps me get better at producing content and increases my exposure so I can continue putting out high-quality information for you guys. Next, I want to extend a personal invitation to shoot me a DM on Instagram at Stacked Strength. I'll help you troubleshoot anything you need. This is literally an invitation to connect with me directly, so make sure you head on over and jump into my DMs. All right, guys, thanks so much for listening, and I'll see you next time.